My name is Mark, a recording angel. I've been observing this earth since the dawn of creation. The Most High has asked me to share my recordings with you. The following are my records of Old Testament prophets and kings, and scheming scoundrels too, collected in this book, Exile of the Chosen, God's Heroes from Solomon to Malachi. If today's recording contains situations which might be uncomfortable for younger listeners, I will mark the video with the words parental guidance recommended. Chapter 9, Part 2, Beulah After drawing water from the well, the girl walked slowly back toward the kitchen area. She felt restless and worried with Ada away. It was true that Anna Thoth was only a few miles distant, but Ada might be there several days depending on how her sister was doing. It wasn't that Beulah couldn't take care of things if any babies chose to come at this time. Rather, it was just that she preferred to do things with Ada. She felt more comfortable with her mother-in-law. Beulah hoped that Ada would be back in time for the royal births. As she neared home, she realized that was not going to happen, as a royal messenger emerged from the gate of the family courtyard. Oh, there you are, the servant called. Come quickly, you're needed at the palace. Let me grab my things, the girl replied. I'll be right there. Taking a deep breath, Beulah drew herself up to her full height. She had been learning from Ada for several years, and though she was just in her teens, the women in the royal family trusted her. Please be with me, God of Judah, she whispered. Don't let me make any mistakes that could harm the little ones coming into the world. Then she hurried to the palace. It was a long labor, since it was a first birth. The queen mother hovered anxiously in the background, but the infant emerged to wail his protest at being thrust into the world. As she held the baby, Beulah whispered her prayer to Yahweh as the child continued to cry and flail his tiny red fists. The queen mother beamed. Beulah, you did a wonderful job. Ada will be so proud of you. The girl smiled. The little prince doesn't seem to think so. Look how furious he is. Ah, the queen mother observed, a prince with a strong will. Hopefully he will use it to Yahweh's glory. The new mother raised up on one elbow. His father is going to name him Daniel, she said. Well, Daniel, Beulah commented, you take that strong will of yours and channel it in the right direction, and no one will be able to stand up to you. In spite of her kind words, Daniel continued to howl. Beulah wrapped him in swaddling bands and tucked him in with his mother, where he settled down to nurse. The queen mother laughed. Ha! Ah, he's going to be a fine strong one. Isn't it funny to have all three of my daughters expecting at the same time? Do you think Ada will get back soon? Beulah shrugged. I, I don't know, but I certainly hope so. I miss her terribly. I'm sure you do, the Queen Mother agreed. But she would be very proud of the job you've done. Well, at least it's done. I'm going to go home and get some rest. Yes, all of us could use some after this little one, keeping us up all night, the Queen Mother sighed. The young midwife headed for home. She felt as if she had only slept a few hours when a servant jostled her awake. You are needed at the palace again. Already? Beulah protested. The servant nodded. Beulah grabbed her things and pulled a cloak over her shoulders. She had slept through the day, but still felt exhausted. Evening was approaching. Could it be the other princess? She wondered. When she arrived at the palace, another servant hurried her into the queen mother's quarters. Is it one of the princesses? Beulah asked. Or is something wrong with the baby we delivered this morning? No, no, it's one of the servants. She's been in labor for two days and the servant midwife was helping her, but nothing is working. I'm afraid the mother is going to die. Beulah accompanied the queen mother to the servant's quarters. The servant girl looked extremely young, perhaps even younger than Beulah. She was pale and exhausted from her ordeal. Carefully, Beulah examined her the way that Ada had taught her. Then she turned to the Queen Mother. You are right. There are serious problems, and I'm concerned for the life of your servant. I think we must do whatever we can to help deliver her of the baby. What about my baby? The girl asked in a weak voice. 
Beulah took the servant girl's hand in hers and looked into her eyes. I am so sorry. I don't believe your child lives. The labor has been too difficult, and I feel no movement. What I need now is for you to work with me, to free you from the infant so that you can live and have other healthy children in years to come. She squeezed the servant girl's hand. What is your name? The girl closed her eyes, and tears trickled down her cheeks. I've known it, she said between gasps. I've known it for days. Beulah wiped her face with a cloth. Then the girl opened her eyes. Hannah, she said. My name is Hannah. What do you want me to do? It was far into the night before Hannah's child was finally delivered, and Beulah had been right. The infant was dead. Thank you for coming, the queen mother said afterward. You have spared the life of one of my favorite servant girls, and you won't go unrewarded. She turned and left the room. Hannah reclined on the cushions, exhausted. Beulah washed and wrapped the child. Would you like to see her? she asked. The girl nodded. As Beulah brought the baby over and placed it in Hannah's arms, tears spilled down the girl's face as she rocked the little bundle. The young midwife stood and caressed the girl's hair as she wept over the dead infant. I don't understand. I don't understand. Why? Why? She kept murmuring. I don't understand either, Beulah whispered. I nodded. Neither of them did. Would it have comforted them to know they didn't have to understand in order to be part of the Mighty One's chosen people? They just had to choose to be loyal to Him. My heart was heavy as I watched the two girls weeping. Sometimes my job is just painful. When Beulah awoke the next day, she heard someone in the courtyard. Pulling on her cloak, she rushed outside. Ada! Ada, I'm so glad you're back! She flung herself into her mother-in-law's arms, then suddenly became aware that the woman was holding something. Careful there, Beulah. I'm happy to see you, too. The woman backed away and held a bundle toward the girl. This is Hananiah. Oh, he's beautiful! Beulah exclaimed. Hananiah, however, did not appreciate his boisterous welcome and raised his voice in protest, flinging his tiny fist back and forth in the air. "'Is this your sister's baby?' Beulah asked. Her mother-in-law's eyes filled with tears. "'Ada, what happened?' "'She died. I could not stop the bleeding after the birth. Hilkiah had no relatives in Anathoth who had given birth recently. There was no one to wet-nurse him. I brought him back here.' where we had a better chance of finding someone. Beulah caught her breath. Of course, Hannah. Quickly she told Ada about the events of the night before. Do you think the Queen Mother would let Hannah come stay with us and nurse Hananiah? I don't know, but we could find out. She mentioned that Hannah was one of her favorite servants. Perhaps that's why she called you for aid, Ada suggested, and you did help her give birth successfully. Yes, I'm so thankful that she didn't die, too. Her mother-in-law sighed. Oh, it is more difficult for a woman to birth a dead child than a living one who's fighting to come into the world. Beulah fought back tears. It was terrible. Suddenly a thought occurred to her. Could it be that the God of Judah intended for me to be there so, so that I would know about Hannah? so that I would know where to find someone to nurse little Hananiah? I don't know, Ada said slowly. It could be. A few evenings later, Beulah was startled to see a priest enter the family courtyard. Who is he? she wondered. And what does he want? But Ada rushed past her and threw her arms around his neck. Hilkiah, how good to see you! Beulah's mouth dropped open. This must be Hilkiah, the priest whose wife had just died giving birth to Hananiah a week before. Are you well? Ada continued. I am, but I've come to ask for your help. What is it? We'll do anything. 
It's Jeremiah. Ada sighed knowingly. Oh, it's a difficult age, and he's just lost his mother. No, there's more to it than that. Truly, it is a difficult age, but he has always been one to think his own thoughts and keep them to himself. I've never understood him. Lately, even before... He paused. Well, even before last week, he had been behaving strangely. He believes the Lord has called him to be a prophet. A prophet? Ada asked in surprise. Beulah's eyes widened, but she said nothing. He's not old enough to be a prophet. He has to be thirty before he's even allowed to serve as a priest. And he must be the same age as Beulah here in his late teens. So officially a man and a son of the law, but so young. Hilkiah nodded. Yes, but since he believes the calling is from God, he's been preaching to the other priests in Anathoth. Oh, dear, the woman laughed. I bet that goes over well. Not at all, Hilkiah frowned. They are ready to stone him for speaking treason against the temple and the city. Treason? she asked in puzzlement. Josiah has been knocking down the altars and bringing about some reforms. Our king is trying hard to bring Judah back to the God we once served a little more enthusiastically than we do now, but we're making progress. Hilkiah took a deep breath and shrugged. I don't know what to do with him. My rotation for serving in the temple is coming up, and I'm afraid that the men in Anathoth will stone him, especially if I'm not there to protect him. May he stay with you for a while? Oh. Certainly, but I'm afraid that if he felt the need to preach to the priest in Anathoth, he's going to really think the inhabitants of Jerusalem are heathens. The priest smiled ever so slightly. That's because they are, he said softly. I know, she replied. Josiah is trying, though. It's just been such a long time that people no longer know how to worship the God of Israel. They're going to have to learn all over again. Better that than being punished until they remember who he is, Ada suggested. Well, now you're sounding like Jeremiah. I thank you greatly and will bring him tomorrow. Ada bowed to him. Would you like to see your other son? He's grown so much just in the few days he's been here. The man's face lit up. Yes, where is he? The family compound was full again. The Queen Mother had given Hannah to Beulah and Ada in gratitude for their midwifery services. Hannah shared Beulah's quarters with the infant Hananiah. Elam had taken a wife and they were expecting a young one soon. So as to have some privacy, he had built for Jeremiah a room of his own, and Hilkiah frequently visited and stayed in his son's quarters. Jeremiah was a shy boy who rarely smiled. Some evenings he would come and sit by the cooking fire with Beulah and tell her stories from the scriptures. One time he described how God had called him to be a prophet, and how he had protested that he was too young, and the Lord had told him not to say that again. Beulah had to smile to herself, for it sounded just like what Ada had said when she had recruited her into midwiving as a young widow, even though she was barely old enough to marry and knew nothing of birthing babies. Perhaps, Beulah said, looking into his dark eyes, perhaps it's only people that care about age. Perhaps Jehovah chooses whom he will as long as they love him and are willing to do what he asks of them. Then they both smiled shyly, realizing that they shared a common bond. I pray for the hope of Israel over every male baby born, she said. Jeremiah glanced up. You do? he said in a surprised voice. I, I thought I was the only one praying daily for the hope of Israel. She shook her head. He's coming, you know. We just don't know when. He could be any one of these little ones being born this year. Ada taught me some of the prophecies of Isaiah. It's very exciting. That they are. Yet it concerns me that most of the people in Judah now pay little attention to our God. If they were to keep his Sabbaths and worship him, this would be the most prosperous place on earth. It'd be like a paradise, but I don't think it can be that way. You don't? No. Uh, all through our history, God has required loyalty and obedience. The people in Judah now just want to ignore him or worship him only when it's convenient and when they can fit him in around their other activities or their other gods. I, I feel that unless our people sincerely turn back to him, uh, terrible things are going to happen. Oh, Jeremiah, 
she whispered. If you say that out loud, people will be very angry with you. He laughed bitterly. Ha! <laughs> they already have been. I've been accused of treason against the king, treason against the temple, and treason against the city of Jerusalem. Aren't you afraid? No. When the Lord called me, the same time as he told me not to keep complaining about being a child, he also assured me that he would protect me, that while people would be extremely angry with me and would do bad things, he would always take care of me. That's amazing, Beulah said. Do you realize how special you are? To be personally protected by the Almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Jeremiah smiled. Uh, I, I always feel happier when I'm near you. <laughs> I smiled. It was true. Beulah always had a positive outlook because of her simple trust in God. And Jeremiah was highly honored to be so protected by one who had the entire universe to care for. Over the next year, two more little princely cousins entered the world. Their parents named them Mishael and Azariah. Beulah went almost daily to the palace to check on her little ones, and they all adored her. Jeremiah referred to the children that she had helped deliver as the Hopes, short for the Hopes of Israel, because of the prayers she said over them. Even though none of those babies were the hope for Messiah, they were Beulah's hopes. They were the happiness and the fulfillment that the Lord had given her, instead of the sad and difficult life she could have had. One day, Jeremiah strode into the courtyard and sat near the fire. Are you hungry? she asked. This pot has some of the best lentil soup I've ever had. Oh, I'm starving. He tore some bread apart and dipped it into the pot. Oh, uh, this is good, he commented. So, uh, how are the hopes today? I saw you playing with them at the palace. Pula laughed. <laughs> they're growing so fast, and they're so much fun. I saw you at the palace, too. You were talking to King Josiah. Yes, the, the priests may not care for me much, but I have the ear of the king. And he is really sincere about bringing our people back to God. Another prophet has been here in Jerusalem this week. His name is Zephaniah, and he is also calling Israel to repentance. She clasped her hands together. Jeremiah, that's wonderful. Then all those things that you've been so worried about aren't going to happen. He stared into the fire thoughtfully. They will happen, but... Josiah is a good, loyal king, and I don't think that any of these things will take place as long as he's king or as long as those who follow him continue to pursue the god of uh, Jacob. But I haven't told you the most exciting thing. Josiah has decided to repair the temple. He's collecting funds for it, and we're going to get it all cleaned out and rebuild the broken places and make it back into a beautiful house of worship for the Mighty One. That's even more wonderful the girl exclaimed. He removed the idols when I first got married. A cloud crossed her face at the memory, then she shrugged it off. That is truly wonderful. I am so glad. You wouldn't believe some of the trash in there, Jeremiah continued. They did take the idols out, but there's a lot of junk just dumped and stored in the temple. It'll really take work. But uh, with the king behind it, I, I think that will be successful. Beulah stared into the fire. We are greatly blessed to have a king who wants to pursue the heart of God, she whispered. Yes, and we're even more blessed to have a God who wants to pursue the hearts of his stubborn people and, and woo them back to him like a lover or a loving parent. If only they knew, I thought. If only they knew how much, how the Mighty One's heart yearned and ached after them, how much he loved them. How could humans ever resist if they had any clue? It was beyond me. Jeremiah returned home that evening in great excitement. He couldn't wait to talk to Beulah, but when he arrived at the family compound, it was not to be. He caught sight of her out near the tall jars where they kept water. What's happening? he asked. Elam's wife is having her baby, she gasped, and things aren't going well. You need to go somewhere else for a while. This isn't a good place for men right now. Feeling disappointed, Jeremiah turned and wandered back toward the temple. He had wanted to talk to Beulah to tell her some exciting news, but he supposed that at a time like this, he should be praying for the child of his cousin Elam. Jeremiah had never liked Elam, 
and Elam only barely tolerated Jeremiah's presence in their home. Somehow he couldn't imagine the Messiah being born from a father like that. Still, the father's attitude was not the child's fault, and he hoped the little one would enter the world healthy. It was the next evening before he had a chance to speak with Beulah, and by then she had already heard the news he had tried to bring her the day before. Isn't it wonderful about the scroll that Shafin found? She bubbled as soon as he entered the courtyard. Jeremiah enjoyed the way she always got so excited over everything. Yes, he said. Shafin gave it to Hilkiah, not my father, but the high priest, and Hilkiah took it to the king, and now the king has contacted the prophetess Huldah, and she's confirmed that it is the law of God. Do you think it's an actual scroll that Moses wrote? Beulah interrupted. Uh, I don't know, but, but, but if it isn't, it's a copy. People have memorized his teachings and passed them down through the generations by word of mouth, but now we can read what he actually said. Perhaps this will be a great time of turning back to the Lord, she suggested. That would be a wonderful thing. Oh, it truly is a time of hope and of change. As long as there are people who are willing to return to the Lord, there's always hope, isn't there? Beulah asked. He smiled. The Lord is always faithful to those who are faithful to him. Every morning he comes up with new mercies for us. He is good. She returned his smile. I was over in the compound of your friend Baruch today, she said, and helped one of his cousins birth another little hope. They're going to name him Ezekiel when they take him in on the eighth day to be blessed. Baruch was so excited. Yes, he's another one like you. He always gets such pleasure out of the little joys in life. Beulah laughed. Oh, the Lord needs people like Baruch and like me to help balance those who worry about all the difficult things. Jeremiah sighed. Uh, it is unfortunate that the Lord needs people like me to continually remind others what will happen if they don't pay attention. I think I'd rather be like you. The Lord wants you just the way you are, Jeremiah. He knew you from before you were born. Perhaps even planned for me. Whoever we are, and whatever part we have in his plan. Isn't he good? As Jeremiah nodded, I nodded too, and my heart filled with hope. As long as there were people like Beulah and Jeremiah, there would be worshippers of the Mighty One, in spite of the calamities that were to come so soon. This broadcast has come from the book Exile of the Chosen by Sally Pearson Dillon, with permission from the Review and Herald Publishing Association. This book and the rest of the series, War of the Ages, can be purchased by going to www.adventistbookcenter.com or by calling 1-800-765-6955. I'm your narrator, Austin Backus, and this audio project is a gift to you from my free Christian book ministry, RXF 1888. Please visit our website, www.rxf1888.com, to request free Christian books for both kids and adults. And join us here again for more stories from Mark the Recording Angel.